Welcome to the Jaros Health Podcast, where we make it easy for you to better serve older adults through our content that informs, community that inspires, and courses that deliver. Hey guys, Alyssa here, bringing to you the Old Not Week segment for Jaros Health. This month, helping clinicians better serve older adults. This month, I wanted to delve into a systematic review that was recently posted on the Facebook group regarding the one-minute sit-to-stand test. And I thought this was kind of interesting to delve into because one of my go-to tests to measure strength during evaluations is the 30-second sit-to-stand test. But thinking it, thinking about it in a little bit different light with the one minute sit to stand test adds in that aerobic endurance component. Because a lot of times when you're trying to test aerobic endurance in a home health setting, you don't always have that nice straight long corridor. Sometimes the setting is a little bit narrower, you have cluttered spaces, you don't have a whole lot of room to kind of complete that. So it makes it a little bit more challenging. So I don't typically tend to use that one. And then the two minute step test kind of run into some problems too. If people have pain with hip flexion, knee flexion, significant weakness that they can't reach the 90, 90 position. So that kind of throws off the validity of that test. So sometimes for me, I find it sort of troubling to kind of put an objective measure to endurance. So this one minute sit to stand test is an interesting avenue. So this systematic review looked at 17 different studies testing the norms, the validity, the reliability of the one minute sit to stand test. Most of them or a majority of them used patients that did not have any pathology. And a lot of them were actually younger people that were tested. But common pathologies or common um, patients with pathologies that were tested um, included lung disease. And then less common was renal disease, stroke, and then osteoporosis. So there was a couple of studies looking at those kinds of things. Most of the um, tests were done on an armless chair between 45 and 48 centimeters. And the one of the criteria for the test is being able to stand up without using your arms to make it a true one-minute sit-to-stand test. And I know that I personally modify the 30-second sit-to-stand tests if patients aren't able to stand up without using arms. So using arms to push off, that sort of thing, depending on their prognosis. So there was a few normative values, but they were a little all over the place just due to they ranged in the pathologies and the age ranges that they were testing in the first place. So there was, you know, a few that you could kind of base on. So the average was about 8.1 reps with patients that had suffered a stroke and then about 50 reps in 20 to 24 year old males. So those were the first couple, and I'll talk about a little bit more about the other normative values later. But the main thing that they looked at the one-minute sit-to-stand test compared to other outcome measures, specifically the 30-second sit-to-stand test, because, I mean, all we're doing is adding extra time. But the fatigue was obviously a lot higher in the one-minute sit-to-stand test versus the 30 seconds, which is where that aerobic piece comes in. But it did also have a comparable increase in heart rate with the six-minute walk test. So when people are doing the one-minute sit-to-stand test, their heart rate, I believe it was increased from, I think it was 19 beats per minute. And with the one-minute sit-to-stand test, it was roughly the same. I think it might have been 18. It was very, very close. The average minimal detectable change... 
So in order to make a, be able to objectively say that a change was made was an increase in four repetitions. So if you had a patient and they didn't necessarily fall into these normative category groups that have already been established, you could use that for repetition change to objectify the making a significant change in aerobic capacity as well as strength. So, and that kind of gets the blurry line because obviously this test is limited by lower extremity strength. If you don't have the appropriate strength, then you will not succeed at this test. But also the aerobic endurance plays a part in it as well. So they kind of have to, it's kind of testing both of these things, which we can say about a lot of outcome measures. A lot of things are not just testing one isolated variable for the most part, especially when we're looking at functional mobility and things like that. So, but this one, you know, you're, you are a little bit limited with that strength piece in order to get the endurance piece, because if they don't have the strength, then you may not be targeting necessarily the endurance piece. So a lot of these studies also looked at using this in pulmonary rehab. So um, I know a lot of the backing behind this study was to prove the correlation with pulmonary function. So the results of this test kind of indicated pulmonary function, and even survival rates in some cases. It was found to have a good test-retest reliability because it is a very simple test. And like I said, again, it's something that can be used very easily in the home if you find an appropriate chair, usually a chair with a hard back. Like I said, it does technically need to be an armless chair, but you can modify as needed. But also one thing to think about when you're using not only this specifically the one minute sit to stand test, but also the six minute walk test and even, you know, the 30 second sit to stand test, the tug, any of these tests do run the risk of performance increasing with repeated testing. So if you do typically a few trials in order to kind of get an average, you may see that performance increases. So you could argue that maybe you don't get a true um, answer or a true result until, is it that last trial or the first trial, depending on, you know, the initial or so that is just something just to kind of keep in mind. If you don't think that the patient fully understood the directions or things like that, then you might want to consider doing a couple of trials, but, you know, kind of use your judgment to make sure that it it kind of shows a full picture of the patient. So A couple of the other norms that were mentioned, like I said, they were kind of all over the place with pathologies, so there may only be one or two studies that kind of validate these normative values, but so patients with COPD, they were averaging about 15, and then compared to 20 reps in healthy adults. And I believe these were a little bit younger of a patient age group. Um, I think they were may have been under under 69, I want to say. Um, so then they also looked at people that were receiving hemodialysis. We're looking at about 25.6 average reps but plus or minus nine. So there is kind of that big range of error as well. So, and then also with patients with stroke, it was around eight, like I said, but it's plus or minus three. So again, there's a little bit more of a range there, but not as large as the dialysis. And then looking at just community dwelling older adults, the study sample size was only 19, so it's a pretty low 
but it was around 34 in males and 26 in females. So, and like I said, that is community dwelling, likely no serious pathologies around that time. And so these studies are starting to come out a little bit more as the test gains a little bit more ground. There was not a info, there was not any info in um, rehab measures at this time. That kind of is a really nice way that spells out all the normative values and validity and things like that. So this test is not yet in there, but it is one test just to kind of start keeping in your back pocket. Like I said, especially if you're in those cluttered those cluttered homes, you have narrow hallways, you know, you don't have a whole lot of space to work with. This is one that you can use to test, like I said, aerobic endurance if you're kind of running into those things I mentioned previously instead of using the six-minute walk test or the two-minute step test. If there are variables that are confounding your ability to do those, then we can move to this one. Because sometimes, you know, we kind of get into our rhythm of what tests you typically use and the sit to stand tests are super common just because it's a movement that people do daily. So it's very specific to goals typically because if people are weak, they typically have problems getting out of chairs. So I think it's a great test that carries over functionally as well and you know, some of the other ones, like I said, are maybe not as easy to complete. So um, it's kind of nice, like I said, to kind of broaden our horizons and, you know, kind of see if you know, we can start using other tests to kind of test a little bit different things, putting a spin on things. So if someone is pretty well or doing pretty well at the 30 second sit to stand test, then maybe we can elongate that a little bit just to kind of look at that added endurance piece as well. So there is a system, like I said, the systematic review, I can post the title in the show notes if you just want to take a peek at that, especially a little bit delving more into the normative values. I'll post that in there, but I hope you guys have a wonderful week and thanks for listening to the Old Nat Week segment. Thank you for listening to the Jaros Health Podcast. Go to jaroshealth.com to get the show notes for this episode and find out how you can join the Jaros community for free. You'll get access to our private Facebook group and the weekly Jaros Recap where we share our favorite reads, podcasts, and any interesting conversations in the Jaros community that week. Once again, that's G-E-R-O-S health.com. Thanks for listening.